Today on the show, we have Jules Brenner. His company is called Industrial Succession. They are an acquirer and manager of small business manufacturers, specifically now in the industrial sector. So Jules, how did you get into just acquiring businesses for a living? I actually started out as a mechanical and aerospace engineer, originally from Brooklyn, New York. Going to college, I was also doing a business minor. So I was interacting with a lot of folks that were on the opposite side of the engineering and, and loved like the combination of both. My early career was in industrial technology, a lot of like venture and PE back startups. And I already was dabbling in that like acquisitions world just from that. I kind of started to think about if there was ways where you can add lots of technologies to the, the most old school businesses I could find. And kind of that led me to a path of research that led me on to where I am today. So this path of research, it led you into the industrial manufacturing sector? Yeah. Yeah. So I was looking at like all different industries for buying a company, operating it, and I wanted to stick to what I knew. So manufacturing is pretty much what I was doing in the industrial technology field, lots of hardware companies. And I knew that I could take some of those skill sets that I learned there and bring it to the mom and pop world and have those businesses be successful and grow as well. So kind of stuck in manufacturing that we predominantly now focus on Southern California. I actually have a, there's a high density of manufacturers out in Southern California, particularly ones that are dealing with metals. So purchased a current company now, which we can talk about in the space and have been looking to continue to expand, to offer these owners of small mom and pop metal fabricators, a good succession plan. How many companies are you looking at at any given time? Oh, we get target. a lot. I mean, the, like how many we want to buy at a time. And we like to take on kind of like one project at a time, if you will, and at least leave enough capacity to spend a few months at that business versus like be split amongst many, as well as like, if we're going to consider buying something else, we want to make sure that that what we already own is stabilized. One of the big things that happens when sellers leave is businesses become unstable, quote unquote. You have to like make sure you understood the business when the seller was there, but then you're also making sure that you have consistent performance, kind of like what the seller had before you start trying to do too much. So we have two methods of finding businesses. We either call businesses directly or have brokers send them to us. Brokers, you could see a few dozen a month calling directly. You can kind of have many calls you want to make. You could see a few hundred a month. But the big thing for us is getting the name out there and letting you know local business owners know what we do. And when timing is right, we're happy to talk. Where do you see your business going over the next few years? Where do you want it to go? Yeah, I mean, the goal for us is really to create a vehicle here where the local metals manufacturing community can really feel proud of kind of contributing their business to that. We love the synergies that lots of metal manufacturers can undertake to be successful, especially with the difficulty of manufacturing in California, let alone just the whole U.S. And we'd like to really build a, you know, a group of companies here that are well diversified in terms of the industries that they service, but the individual plants are highly specialized and niche in regards to the way they approach the customer. We have companies now in infrastructure construction that they're very focused on one way of doing business that maybe is not the same way that you should do business for, let's say, aerospace, right? That requires different quality standards and things like that. So our goal is to create a diversified business and really get the whole entity to be doing at least a hundred million in revenue. So are you going with like a Carnegie model here, You're trying to acquire all the metal companies? Yeah, similar. It's, it's unfortunately really sad. You know, I moved out to California out of college and that's where I, I used to see a lot of just meet mom and pop business owners. And it really sucks. Cause like, there's a, a lot of people know about like the great succession, if they will, where a lot of you know the baby boomers are retiring in mass all over the U S and they have nowhere to put their businesses for the future, but it's particularly bad in Southern California in the manufacturing metals community, where a lot of the folks, they all know each other. They've been already hit so many times by like just cost of living in California, cost of doing business in California, manufacturing competition from other states as well as outside of the U.S. And on top of that, COVID, and now that it, it, they're all sick of the same complaints I get, traffic and taxes and all that, and they all just want to leave and go out to cheaper states like Idaho. So we're seeing a lot of those come to market. And I think in, a, in, in the mission of getting to that like Carnegie level scale, we also want to make sure as little of these businesses have to shut down without a succession plan. It's the saddest story we'll get when we hear about like a local shop that they just shut down, maybe from a vendor or something. And we're like, ah, oh, damn, we didn't, we didn't let them know about what we do. Because if, if they did, then we could have kept those jobs. We could have kept that, that name alive in California. So you bring, you're bringing a lot of efficiency. 
when you go into these operations? Yeah, that, that's a big part of it. So we're not a private equity group, so we don't have like a committed fund that we have to like deploy, collect management fees on, sell the company in five years, none of that stuff, right? We're big fans of the buy and permanent hold model, use recapitalizations to extract money out and pay out dividends to shareholders. And the way we can do that without having to also do some of the things that private equity is known for, such as like moving locations, changing the name, letting go of a bunch of staff, et cetera, is we focus on heavy uses of technology. So applying what I kind of used in my former career, we love using technology to help save us from like hiring for certain roles that then force us to like be very aggressive with just expenses. So we save on that and then we use the technology to help us really throttle sales efforts so that we can get to an operating leverage standpoint earlier with less existing resources, thereby keep people's jobs, but also make a much more stable business. And then as we start to continue to bring in partners and, and buy other companies, we really start to get a strong feel on very like key detailed metrics. We literally have seen so many of these businesses now that we know how much a healthy metal manufacturer in Southern California should be spending on employee per square footage of real estate that they're on down to like the age of the machines and, and you know, what useful life they have. So th there's a lot of advantages, if you will that come out by being like super hyper focused and localized. And we love the fact of like, when we meet a business owner that maybe has been working in, I don't know, they do, they've been servicing aerospace for many years. And now we come, we have, you know, companies we own in aerospace as well as infrastructure and other industries that are still healthy in Southern California. We can offer them a piece of that journey. I think that really helps them not only see their legacy live, but know that they're, they can kind of breathe easy knowing that they're own business and investments are diversified amongst different industries. Since you're buying in one central area, Southern California, are you also consolidating facilities in some cases? We try not to like, uh, so I mentioned the aerospace versus let's say infrastructure manufacturing sectors. So for example, in aerospace, they, it's top secret. Lots of times so they send you the one part of the airplane and they want you to make thousands of them. It's super predictable. Quality is really important, etc. So in that kind of mentality not only bleeds to the shop floor, but also to the office in the way that the estimators and all of them function. Now you talk about the polar opposite of that, where it comes into like infrastructure and construction. It's a lot of last minute requests, less predictability, higher margins for that, but they'll also even hand you 200 pages of a, a whole building that needs to be built and say, you figure out where all the metal is and you got to do that for them. So the estimators that function there, they have to talk, think, react differently than aerospace. So we like the, we, we like keeping certain industries in certain facilities and not mix and mingling too much, but having the businesses be local enough where it's like, if every building was within, let's say a 15 minute drive from the center, then you can successfully manage all those without mixing, mixing the way they, they do business and thereby giving the customer the, the highest quality product that came from the most niche type of service while providing still diversity for the holding company in regards to the way it gets revenue. Does this also give you an, a unique ability to go out for larger contracts because you have essentially a pool of businesses under you? Yeah, it's a good question. It definitely does. What it does is it allows us to really cross sell to customers. So oftentimes like our, let's say for the gen big general contractors we deal with on the infrastructure side, our you know, infrastructure business has two divisions of construction that it services. They're officially called five and seven. Five is miscellaneous metals. It's fabrication only. Seven is any metals that go on the outside of a, a building, like a roof or siding. That's fab and install. Now we historically in the business we own now, it used to do just five only, but then we found customers asking for the seven division seven part as well. And we started offering that service too. So we can definitely capture more portions of a single job, but also it's just easier to deal with. And like, this is where that having the facilities be focused part is really crucial. So that general contractor customer that calls us whenever they need metal, custom metal for some project, they can make one phone call and they know that there's very likely most of the scope that they need picked up can get picked up by one party. This is a very interesting business model. I, I, I'm quite interested by everything you're doing. So you said in addition to just going out acquiring and offering management services, you, you do offer a model for people to come in and invest in this. 
Yeah. Yeah. So we're big fans of having this be entrepreneurs buying businesses from entrepreneurs, right? We think it's a very natural way to go versus like if you're dealing with a private equity fund, that money might have come out of a pension fund or from another country, whatever. And the story of like keeping like funds from like small business owners that, you know, maybe they, they themselves bought, sold or successfully operate their companies, have extra cash flows that they want to invest. They maybe don't have the, you know, the time or desire to, or the risk appetite to go buy another business in full, own it, operate it, whatever. We love that we're able to offer them a place to take a piece of the pie here and see that grow. And a current opportunity we've been operating, we, we have a good pool of you know, investors that have participated with us, most of which are operators of businesses themselves actively right now. And we'd like to continue keeping that. We're very open to like the family offices and stuff like that if they ever want to talk to us too. But yeah, we, we definitely see partners as part of the journey you know, for growth. So if one of our listeners wanted to check out either how to invest or sell their business, how can they do so? Yeah. So sell their business. We, you can always reach out to us at deals at industrial com. Right now, we've really been focusing on just local Southern California. But if anyone just wants to reach out and like talk about an interest for now or for the future, just like kind of like a, any big, many big transactions in someone's life, they often need planning. So happy to talk to people earlier than whenever they have that immediate date that they want to see themselves out either fully or partially from their businesses. And then on the investment side, always looking to talk to partners. My email is jbrenner at industrial succession. It's Brenner with a B-R-E-N-N-E-R. I'm always happy to talk to folks if they're actively interested in participating in something like this. And then if you just any partners ever want to talk, it's the same email as well. Well, thank you, Jules, for being on the show. And thank you, everybody, for listening to another episode of Failing to Success. I'm your host, Chad Kalecki with Cosmic Design and Development. Make sure to subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.